Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this first webinar uh, hosted by the Royal College of Surgeons of England uh, on the tricky subject of COVID-19. Uh, and we're going to try and cover in the next hour a series of questions that you've posed to us uh, and uh, do an extended Q&A session. Can I start, therefore, by welcoming everybody who's on the call. We understand that we have something of a motley crew of uh, surgeons, surgical trainees, dentists, uh, dental trainees, uh, medical students, uh, and individuals from the United Kingdom and overseas. So it's a broad church, and I hope that this is a useful event, and at the end of it, you are uh, at least a little better informed if, as somebody once said in the legal profession, uh, none the wiser. Um, what we're gonna try and do to begin with is just show you some of the things that we've done so far, uh, and then we'll deal with some of the questions that we've received uh, to date. I'm sure that you're all reading the slide that we've put up in front of you there. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, you will, I hope, be aware that we've been working intercollegiately with the other three colleges in the United Kingdom and in Ireland because of the fact that surgeons from all four colleges have to work together. Uh, so we issued uh, a statement uh, last week uh, about withdrawing from face-to-face -face, uh, activities within our colleges uh, and some of the knock-on effects that that has, such as the suspension of examinations and a variety of tasks that the colleges uh, undertake. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? This, I think, is probably tonight's big take-home message, and I cannot emphasize this too much. It's really critical that every surgeon understands that you have a responsibility not only to protect yourself, but also to protect your colleagues from the risk of contamination and infection, and in turn, the patient who might be in front of you, and of course, all the other patients who you subsequently might come into contact with. Uh, in order to minimize that risk, you must ensure that you are adequately protected for the situation in which you find yourself. So please make sure that you understand what adequate protection is. Make sure that you understand the instructions and procedures that your trust has put in place. Uh, and that you understand infection control and levels of protection. If you are in a situation where you believe that you are being put at risk due to failure of supply of appropriate protective equipment, your responsibility is to ensure that you bring that to the immediate attention of either senior managers, consultants, but somebody who is nominally responsible for that in your trust. I appreciate that there are situations where emergencies occur and you didn't have time to think about the implications of offering patient an emergency treatment, for instance, to stop bleeding or in a resuscitation effort. But please, as soon as it is completed, consider the risk that you have put yourself at, and the risk that you then pose to your colleagues and other patients, and consider the need for you to, as it were, distance and isolate yourself on that risk basis. Okay. That's the party political broadcast, and I hope that that message is clear and is not ambiguous. Uh, this uh, slide will stay available for you uh, while we make our way through the webinar, 
I'm going to hand over now very briefly to Andrew Reid, our Chief Executive. Uh, thank you, Derek. Thanks for that and welcome everybody this evening. I should, we should also introduce Lucy Davis, who you can see on the screen, our Director of Engagement, who's going to field the questions that come into the webinar. And I suspect, Derek, most of them will be for you. As a non-surgeon, I will try and help you as much as possible. That might be <laughs> your support. I wish I could hand you a drink with it as well. Anyway, thanks to everyone <laughs> for uh, attending tonight, and, and particularly thanks for lots of questions that have come in uh, before the webinar, the webinar started. We are going to leave questions, of course, for people who raise them during the webinar, but we thought we'd just kick off uh, with picking up some of the questions that came in beforehand. And actually, although there have been quite a few questions, we can group them into two or three um, themes. So uh, not su surprisingly, I'm sure everyone would expect that the first theme that's come up is about uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. Um, so Derek, I'll hand back to you to pick up that theme. So I'll try my best to um, provide a kind of overview of the uh, five questions that we received. Um, uh, Paul, Jonathan, Tim, uh, Tom, uh, Bogdan and Bimbi. Um, so let's, let's begin with a, a very blunt statement. Obviously, as we withdraw from the provision of simple elective low risk surgery, low risk, I mean low risk of contamination, surface surgery, um, the types of surgery that are left behind for us to do are urgent cases and emergency cases. And of course, we are trying our best to stratify those to find non-surgical alternatives whenever possible. This means, of course, that the vast majority of work we are doing is essentially either urgent, emergency, or happens to be fairly complex. That's particularly the case with cancer surgery, and we'll return to that later this evening. For just about all surgery that occurs, therefore, nowadays uh, that we're doing, we have a number of specific risks. And the one that's probably the most important is aerosoling, because we know that aerosol con contamination uh, is important. We know that it's a very important potential form of spread and it needs to be considered and you need to be adequately protected uh, in order to minimize the risk of transmission by aerosol spread. So this is important in laparoscopic surgery. It's important, obviously, in orthopedic surgery. Uh, anything that produces smoke, uh, as it were, you know, can also carry biological particles and you must be protected appropriately for that. That means, of course, we are moving more and more towards level three uh, protection uh, in the operating theatre environment. I think that as a rule of thumb, we've now reached a stage where we have to make an assumption that all patients with whom we come into contact uh, are potentially COVID-19 positive. So some efforts have to be made to try and assess that risk. Obviously, in the dire emergency case, you will not be in a position where that risk can be uh, dealt with beforehand in a patient who's asymptomatic, uh, but who needs an urgent operation to stop bleeding. Now that's a, a very clear situation. You must be adequately protected, but those types of surgery anyway would almost certainly require high level protection. For uh, you might say urgent surgery, it's incumbent that you have tried your best to find out whether or not that patient is COVID-19 positive, either on the basis of blood testing, accepting that it's not perfect, or CT scanning. For patients who are undergoing major types of surgery, then uh, 
uh, that's particularly cancer surgery, of course, uh, then there is nearly always time to find out about the patient's status. But of course, those major operations nearly always involve a risk of aerosoling. So uh, the idea that there's some downgrading will hardly ever apply. So I think that as long as you consider the degree of risk, as long as you understand whether or not in a particular operation, the main, whatever it is you believe the main risk to come from, then it's not as complicated as perhaps uh, some people would wish it to be. If there's aerosol risk, then, then there is substantial risk. If there is droplet risk, you must think about how much droplet risk is there in this procedure. Uh, in something like an open laparotomy, where there might be extensive um, uh, fluid contamination, then droplet risk is, of course, substantial. So I think that these are the kind of issues that have been raised. Um, I'm just glancing at the questions here. Um, and I think that that covers the kind of five issues that people re really had. One very specific one that was raised was upper gastrointestinal endoscopy, a common procedure. Uh, the feeling and the guidance that the four colleges produced yesterday was that upper GI endoscopy should be considered a high-risk aerosol procedure. Uh, and on that basis, uh, you should uh, wear uh, appropriate uh, protective equipment for a high-level uh, aerosol procedure. I think that that pretty well covers the various questions that were asked about uh, PPE. Um, uh, in respect to the different patient groups that we have to now deal with. Okay, thank, thanks, Derek. Um, and as I say, people on the webinar, everyone, please do send in your questions in case there's anything that um, hasn't been covered in that area. I'm sure there are many things, so please do send the questions in. So, Derek, the next area was testing. I think this was particularly around the vexed issue of uh, doctors and indeed yeah. other medical staff who have symptoms yeah. of what might be uh, COVID um, who are being told to go home and self-isolate without being tested and therefore taking them out of the clinical resource available. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and just before I talk about testing, there was one thing that I forgot to mention there on the uh, subject of PPE, and that is the availability of equipment uh, at different types of hospital and different sites across the uh, United Kingdom at the moment. Uh, it's quite clear that there is a problem there. Uh, we have been made aware of some fairly major hospitals that have not had the right level equipment available uh, and, and uh, surgeons have been put at risk. Um, this is really unacceptable. Uh, it's a point that we have hammered home to the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges uh, and indeed forms uh, one of the reasons why we have um, issued some guidance that is not entirely uh, in line with uh, previous guidance that was out in order to put pressure on the system to ensure that the action is taken uh, in very uh, short order. Testing. Um, we were asked about the sensitivity and specificity of uh, the PCR testing. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the bottom line, I suppose, out of this is that there is a false negative rate um, that could be around the 20% mark. Uh, that's um, a fact that we probably to live with it's not clear to me whether just how strong the evidence is in the united kingdom that that is a figure that can be trusted um you know that the largest uh, data that came to us about the value of testing comes from china 
and um, it doesn't necessarily follow that uh, the results there would be exactly the same as the results here. Uh, but clearly it is the case that the test does not identify every patient. Um, this raises a possibility, of course, in your mind that you must therefore presume that all patients uh, are COVID positive um, if they've not been tested and not been shown to be positive. What we therefore have to do is make sure that whenever possible, you undertake some inquiry of the patient to give yourself reasonable assurance before you have a patient encounter about what you believe that patient's likely status is and what you believe the risk is that that patient poses to you in that specific uh, clinical encounter. Um, there is an implication, and we should be careful here because the data are not strong, that CT scanning uh, may have some extra sensitivity and be able to pick up some patients who are otherwise not diagnosed. There is wide variation as from my understanding of the literature and I spent about half an hour this afternoon just trying to see if I could synthesize it. But I was drawn to the conclusion that of course uh, the sensitivity of CT scanning in China may be quite different from the CT scanning ability. We don't know anything about the technologies that we use, the protocols that were followed, and there is wide variation. It is possible that it may be an advantage, and certainly if blood testing is not available, it does represent some alternative that perhaps could be used in some patients. For instance, the patient who is having a CT scan for clinical reasons on another part of their body could easily have their chest included. This starts to get tricky in some patient contexts, for instance, in children, but it's just worthwhile bearing in mind. Uh, I think that was the main issues around uh, testing. Okay, th thank you, Derek. So the next area is practice, and actually, there are probably a number of areas that we've already covered under this. So there's a question, for instance, from uh, Jonathan on is it safe to do laparoscopic procedures, um, given the gas, et cetera. Um, yeah. so, uh, Eleanor sent in a question on ENT. Um, we've got a range of questions on uh, pediatric surgery coming in as well. So, um, okay. Um, I'll you. try and... I'll try and do my best on uh, on these various issues. So, uh, laparoscopic surgery uh, probably probably uh, poses uh, an additional risk because uh, of the fact, as most of you know, uh, we're working uh, with uh, uh, an intra-abdominal increased pressure uh, above normal. Uh, 10, 15 uh, millimeters of mercury, something like that. And of course, you have a similar situation in other closed cavities, uh, for instance, in the chest. Um, the, uh, we know that there is a risk of um, aerosoling in relation to it. So our general advice that we put out yesterday in relation to abdominal surgery by general surgeons is to give very careful consideration to the use of laparoscopic surgery and in general, in general, to uh, if there's a preference to be made to move towards open surgery with its lower risk of aerosol contamination of a theater area. Now that's not to say that laparoscopic surgery should not be performed because there are clearly circumstances where a laparoscopic operation is a major, uh, uh, major benefit to that patient and where the benefit would outweigh the risk. And I could give you a very simple example of carrying out acute appendicectomy 
in a morbidly obese patient who might have some other comorbid conditions. The recovery of such a patient, of course, is much, much smoother after a laparoscopic procedure than having to make an extraordinarily large uh, incision in a morbidly obese patient to simply take out uh, an offending appendix. So the real issue here is the one of judgment and uh, our feeling in general is that if if it's a close call then err on the side of open rather than laparoscopic surgery but that is not to say that we recommend that no laparoscopic surgery should take place uh, one of the other issues that's raised uh, in that sense is whether or not avoidance of surgery uh, is increasingly appropriate and the example that was used was acute appendicitis, but we could have said acute gallbladder disease or picked any one of a dozen acute uh, infective conditions. Uh, it's true, and in fact, we would support the idea that more patients could have acute appendicitis managed in a non-operative fashion uh, in the current crisis. But please remember that the non-operative strategy for acute appendicitis comes with its own limitations and some of its own caveats. Uh, for instance, uh, it's probably best if you are going to follow this strategy that the patient has had some high quality imaging to show that they do indeed have an inflamed appendix and that they do indeed do not have uh, evidence of widespread peritonitis uh, and that a non-operative strategy is reasonable. So this would, of course, take you into the availability of other resources within your institution at that time to ensure that, again, the risks uh, of operation are outweighed some reasonable extent by the benefits of a non-operative approach. Um, let's just see. Uh, one of the things that uh, was raised is the issue of laminar flow and positive ventilation in an operating theatre. And some of you will have observed that the guidance that we released yesterday with the other colleges and the specialist associations questioned the existing guidance uh, in relation to uh, having uh, ventilation running in a positive sense in an operating theatre. Uh, this largely relates, of course, to the levels of protection that we've had available and our ability to uh, follow that um, this is a piece of guidance that may well be revised uh, over the next few days. But we felt very strongly that it was an issue that had to be addressed. This combination of level of personal protection and level of protection in the theater environment. One of the issues that seems to be becoming more common is the use of the operating theatre uh, environment, uh, that is the operating theatre suite, to act as an overflow intensive care unit for COVID-19 positive patients. And this raises the issue of the circulation of virus uh, throughout the whole theatre area and the way in which air flows are working across the entirety of the theatre suite, not simply the way in which the airflows are working in the operating theatres themselves. We're not sure at the moment how great this risk is with the two systems, uh, but we felt that it was justified to raise this as an issue because of some of the events that have occurred in Italy uh, in relation to how some surgeons may have been infected. 
um, we can ill afford to lose surgical staff at this critical time. And if this is an issue, it needs to be addressed. And so we were really trying to raise the profile of this issue uh, because we felt that our efforts to raise this issue were perhaps uh, not being fully appreciated. Okay, Derek, I'm just uh, conscious there's a lot of stuff uh, yeah. we've asked before the uh, webinar. There's also a lot of questions coming in. Uh, Let's go for it. Webinar. So I suggest maybe we can go across to you, Lucy, to get some questions that have been coming in since we started. Yes, of course. Um, just to give you an update on the numbers, we've got about 400 people online and we've got about 100 questions. So I'll see how we get on um, with, okay. the, with the questions this evening. So to kick off um, from Hannah, um, is there any guidance for how emergency rotors will affect people who are less than full time? Um, let me just whoops a daisy. I'm just um, I'm fiddling here. You'll all have to be. Uh, You'll all have to be. Um, it's something he does from time to time. I'm sorry I, about I, that. I, don't, I, don't, I don't multitask well. I'm a man, remember. Um, sorry, rotors. Yes, for less than full time. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a real problem in the construction of rotors from my conversations with, with people um, and the way in which it's been worked out. It's clearly something that's occurring um, mainly at local level and there does seem to be wide variation. That variation is probably more than can be uh, reasonably accepted. Um, of course, it's, um, it's very difficult at the moment to be prescriptive about this. When people are working less than full time are undoubtedly under some degree of pressure to try and increase their hours, which may be completely impractical for them uh, in order to do that. Uh, I know that it's an issue that was discussed by uh, Health Education England yesterday. I wasn't present at the meeting, but I had feedback from it. And it's an issue that we could take up and we will uh, get back to the questioner to see if we can come up with a more specific answer rather than me just saying, yes, we're aware of it, but we haven't fixed it. OK, thank you. Um, and from one of our members in Egypt, how can we take precautions here in Egypt against the coronavirus? Um, I mean, obviously, one hopes that your government um, and uh, health ministry and the various other ministries that I know in, in Egypt um, contribute towards health care. Um, and I'm sure that they will have given you advice, but um, please make best use of the advice on the college website that we have and you can also of course access the advice uh, provided by the NHS uh, on the virus or COVID-19 either site will find it um, and follow that guidance carefully. Um, I think the, the sentiment that I expressed right at the start is really important. Um, we can ill afford in any healthcare system to lose surgeons. Um, you know, we have to maintain a workforce to deal with emergency and urgent work uh, that will go on in spite of uh, uh, COVID. And we have to have people capable of doing that. Um, if we start to lose our surgical workforce, then even more patients will die and they will die unnecessarily. OK, so someone's asking about time frame and elective surgery. So um, do we have an estimated time frame from when we return to elective surgery? What are we working towards? <laughs> um, how long is a piece of string? Um, I think that there, we cannot at this point in time give people any clear assurance uh, about when elective surgery will recommence and when we will get back to something that you would call business as usual. Now, um, I'm not trying to duck the question, but it's clearly many months away. And the reason I say it's many months away is that, of course, 
uh, if all of our information is correct, the crisis uh, is not yet at its peak in terms of the demands on the NHS to deal with COVID-19. The situation that at the outset of the outbreak in this country, we had an unacceptable number of patients waiting for planned surgery anyway. That number will have increased substantially by the number of months that we are unable to do that work. But when we begin to resume work, remember those patients will not be at the front of the queue. It will be all the patients with relatively urgent problems. And in that group, I'm sorry, I would include the that there will be cancer patients and they will have to be dealt with as part of what you might call a recovery plan. So on whatever date we have some relaxation of restrictions, then our first priority will be to deal with that backlog of urgent work. And we've never really created a substantial backlog of urgent work in the past then we'll be able to address the planned work of lesser urgency. And I think that that will take us many months before we are back to something that we would call normal service. I think you shouldn't also ignore the fact that as we come through this, at the end of it, people will probably need a break. Everyone has worked incredibly hard and is going to continue to work incredibly hard for some months to come. And at the end of that, I think that it's unreasonable to think that you can sort of just switch everything back on as if we were in the middle of 2019. Uh, it's probably not going to be like that. So I think it will take a lot longer than people imagine before we're able to resume, let's say, normal service, uh, the circumstances under which the vast majority of trainees will make their progress and have their assessments performed. This is a, a major issue for us, isn't it, Derek? Because it's, um, it, it's uh, huge for patients. We probably all know someone who is waiting on a waiting list or has been cancelled recently. Uh, it's a big issue for the profession and certainly before coronavirus uh, hit us, it, it was certainly one of our biggest uh, issues that we yeah. were dealing with. We were having conversations with NHS England uh, at the highest level, should we say, and actually making quite a lot of progress with them in, uh, in trying to develop plans, albeit long-term plans, to deal with this backlog, as Derek says, there are something like four and a half million people on a waiting list in England alone, yeah. uh, let alone yeah. other uh, home countries. It's an absolute uh, disaster from that point of view. I think we all recognise that um, coronavirus has to take priority uh, along with life-saving emergency surgery now, but it is something that we, we are just keeping on the agenda for, uh, certainly for yeah. NHS England and Wales and Northern Ireland have got major problems as well. Uh, and we'll keep coming back to as we can during the course of this sort of emergency period. Yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, we were in a bad place before that, and we will undoubtedly be in a much worse place uh, at the end of this episode, uh, as far as patients are concerned. Okay, right. so we've got some questions from some um, trainees. Uh, many trainees yeah. um, will have the majority of their next six months adversely affected by COVID-19. Do you think trainees should all extend training by six months? <laughs> I knew someone would ask a tricky question like that. Um, so once again, uh, I have not 
uh, had the full report from yesterday's HE meeting at which this type of uh, question was raised. And I, I know that the head of HE um, is looking very carefully at this particular issue about training times and extensions and other ways in which people can be assessed and the way in which entry into training will have to be handled this year, uh, etc. So um, just about every issue in relation to training uh, has been examined. Um, the only thing I think that we can fairly say to all trainees is that no individual should be specifically disadvantaged in some way as regards their training progress by the effects of COVID-19. I think that all surgeons of all grades are having their professional lives affected by COVID-19. So everybody has to suffer a bit. Nobody is getting the ideal training that they signed up for that they expected. No consultant is able to deliver care to the standard that they would normally expect to without hindrance. We all have to bear a little bit of the pain that exists in that sense. What we mustn't do is to allow individuals to suffer specifically uh, in terms of their assessment, their progress, or something of that nature uh, as a result of this. Beyond that, I don't really think that we can make promises to people about dates, uh, etc. Okay, uh, what about trusts who are still doing elective cancer surgery? Do you think that they are putting patients and staff at more risk? Um, you know, this is a really difficult question to answer because we are very much on shifting sand at the moment uh, in that regard. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, one has to accept that a major cancer operation is a fairly powerful immunosuppressant. Um, People have to, there is an immune response to surgery, uh, which takes up a lot of your reserves. And we therefore must understand that in exposing a patient to a major cancer operation, indeed any major operation, exposes the patient to risk. It's just not clear at the moment exactly whether or not exposing patients to that increased risk is genuinely uh, to their detriment or is the risk of getting the operation and being fixed uh, beneficial to the patient. Uh, we just do not have good evidence on that score at the moment. Interestingly, um, not to divert too much into another area, but um, there are two trainee-led research uh, collaboratives in the United Kingdom who are trying to see how much, uh, uh, what the effect is of surgery on patients uh, during this crisis and it, among those specifically who are COVID-19 positive. Um, the Welsh trainee surgeons have a website called at op covid who are hoping to try and produce guidelines around protection or uh, uh, protective equipment and uh, to find out just how much variation there is there at the moment they're trying to work on that but interestingly the global surge uh, outfit whose uh, website is called covid surge uh, are trying to um, uh, ascertain what the uh, effect on surgical outcomes is if you operate on patients who are COVID-19 positive. And they are doing this on a global basis. So if people are interested uh, in trying to find out uh, about this, uh, there's, there are two websites that you can go to 
and as a trainee you can get involved um, in the way that you probably have done in the past. I think the situation with cancer surgery is probably changing. Um, I think for some very major cancer resections, um, it's probably inappropriate to simply say that you can go ahead with doing uh, some of these operations. And I am aware that there are some parts of the country that have stopped doing some types of cancer surgery. We have not yet reached an absolute decision about whether or not we should be considering uh, the a reduction in the amount of cancer surgery that takes place for some cancers. Uh, but it is something that merits consideration uh, whether or not the delay uh, is outweighed by the fact that the patient might get a much better outcome if they could be operated on uh, when there's less risk of uh, uh, picking up COVID and when we have more like our normal resources available to us uh, for patients to undergo surgery. You're looking very intently at something, Lucy. Just, uh, if... <laughs> yes, Andrew. Just, just before we get into the next, Eric, uh, if I can I just remind everybody that we've obviously got a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, we will, uh, after the webinar, try and pick up uh, as many of those as we can and uh, post questions to those as well. So, I mean, you keep the questions coming in and for those of you. Okay, thank you. So the, can we do it? I had a chance. Well, it's not, not Andrew, we're losing you. Question Andrew, being we're answered, losing you. Oh, well, that's what happens. That's all right, Derek, we're in charge. Perfect. Right. Well, this is what happens okay. when you live in the remote <laughs> flatlands in the east of England. Okay. Um, can we can we do away yeah. with things like two WW pathways in the current climate? Uh, I think that it's inevitable that uh, that will happen, and I think at local level, people must look very carefully at the resources available to them and do whatever they think is best. Um, the idea is that. Uh, there will be local groups um, of experts who will try and do their best to work out how best to prioritise any group of patients who would normally uh, be covered by a two-week wait system or some other uh, sense of urgency in order to try and optimise the care for as many patients as possible in the safest circumstances that are available. One thing that might uh, be worthy of exploration is if uh, hospitals and trusts could work in uh, organised networks where there might be some sharing uh, to uh, try and maintain services. Now, this might be worth exploring, and that's the most we can say at the moment, because just about everywhere, certainly in the south of England, is pretty well overrun and the likelihood that will increasingly overrun as you move further north seems high enough. Um, so it might be a complete failure, but there might be uh, opportunities in some specialties for uh, trusts to collaborate in order to offer patients treatment. Um, I'm aware in the specialty of neurosurgery, for instance, that a number of trusts have collaborated to try and maintain a service for patients with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So there, there may be ways in which you can deal with urgent problems uh, and to eat with patients on that basis. Um, we, we can explore it, and I think it's worthy of exploration, but whether or not it turns out to be a worthwhile solution, um, I just couldn't say at the moment. Okay, um, so this is what we're all doing. Um, what, can, Lucy, be... can you just hear me now? You keep coming and going. Okay, Derek, should we move on? I'm fine. Oh, okay. I'm still. Um, 
Um, will there a COVID response prompt hospital? No, I'll carry on and talking visit... in that case, Matt, can you hear? What is he doing? <laughs> um, will the response prompt more hospital um, teleconferences and working from home for certain clinics and situations? Uh, I, I think, the, you know, now one, I'm never going to describe this as having even the most remote of silver linings. But yes, I mean, the possibility that it, that it will alter work practices substantially, that people will see the benefits of being able to do teleconferencing, uh, the abilities of being able to do teleconsultations, um, the fact that we've kept uh, people with trivial complaints away from accident and emergency departments uh, because of the restrictions on movement. Uh, yes, you know, the, all these things might just make a difference and alter the way in which society views healthcare in the future, and it may encourage more people to use technology to find simple solutions to simple problems uh, instead of, as it were, uh, falling into the uh, jaws of the NHS. So yes, it might just be have something useful that comes out of it, but dear me, what a way to try and improve matters. Okay. Um I think you kind of covered this, but I think it would be quite good to, to just say it again. Um, what specific steps can we take to mitigate our risk when um, the um, FFP3 masks are not available in terms of operating? Uh, don't operate on a patient if you believe that there is high risk to you as a result of doing it. Um, you know, Part of life and limb surgery, you will end up doing it uh, with uh, inadequate protection because you will probably not have chance to think about the level of protection you need uh, because of the nature of what happens right in front of your eyes. The patient with multiple trauma who's brought in uh, in a critical state. Of course, it's natural behaviour to get involved in the care of that patient urgently in order to save life. Everyone understands that. In every other situation, you have time to stand back and think about it. And, you know, the sad fact is that if you become infected and you infect some of the rest of your team and you then in there and you infect a whole pile of other patients who were not infected, just think of the additional harm that you may then have done uh, to those other patients. And remember that if you go down and you can't help anybody else, there's a whole pile of other patients who may be deprived of reasonable surgical care. So I, really understand the difficult ethical decision that you must make in this circumstance. But I cannot emphasize enough the fact that you must not be pressurized into operating on patients when you put yourself at substantial risk by using inadequate protection. Can you hear me now? I hope I'm back on the uh, system. Yeah, you're, you're back. You, you, are. Sound you, like, are. you sound like you're on Radio Caroline about halfway across the North Sea, but only you and I will remember Radio Caroline. Yeah. Everybody on the call is far too young. So speak, speak for yourself, Mr. President. And uh, <laughs> I've noticed over the last three years that uh, the systems are being difficult for us Sunderland supporters. I don't know why that is. Um, <laughs> for um, for all of that, and you might, while I've been, you know, doing other things, I suspect Netflix has been switched on in my house. Uh, you might already have touched on this. There's a question that came in before the webinar, uh, which was particularly about people, uh, consultants as well as trainees, being asked to go beyond their, if you like, their core um, training, their, their uh, core expertise. Uh, there's a particular question about upper limb surgery surgeon who might be asked to do lower limb procedures that Derek I don't know whether you've covered that if you haven't you might want to say something about it yeah um 
I, I think again, this applies probably as much to trainees as it does to consultants, or maybe even more so to trainees. And I understand uh, junior trainees are particularly being, as it were, redeployed. And I think again, we are very clear about redeployment uh, of staff into areas where they are not familiar. So I think if you are being asked to work in a surgical area, especially, or to do something that is outside your known competency, something in which you, it's completely, as they say, Greek to you, then uh, you really should only agree to participate if somebody will give you some reasonable training that allows you to do that job safely. Now, that does mean working in an area that is unfamiliar to you and making sure that in that area you are adequately protected in a way that seems appropriate. So I think that if you are not competent in that area, you mustn't go there without an understanding of the training that you'll get and the supervision that you'll get when you are there if you are a trainee. Perhaps the only type of exception to that is if you are asked to help out in an area where in the past you were competent. Uh, you may have done a job in cardiology in an earlier part of your training, uh, but now you're training to be an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, you may feel capable of helping with only minimal extra training. You understand what actually happens, uh, but what you really want is to have some decent supervision and that uh, you know who to call if there is a problem. So there is a bit of judgment involved, but the strong message, I think, is don't try and function outside your competency without some training and without having some supervision, backup, call it what you will, depending on your level of experience. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's been a question um, from Tim Goodacre, uh, one of our yep. council members, about um, kind of ways of working and then the scrutiny of ethics protocols and their pitfalls. Um, the ethics issue is a very complex one. There are groups working at the moment uh, very intensely on uh, trying to come up with ethical frameworks. Uh, that's uh, the kind of general issues that should be being considered in a trust in order to decide on what is appropriate or inappropriate treatment for a patient. Uh, and then there's a second more practical issue about who are the individuals within a specific organization who can responsibly, as it were, uh, do this on a daily basis or on a regular basis in order to determine who should and who should not receive a specific type of treatment. Um, it's not fully organized yet. I'm aware that many trusts have created short-term ethical uh, groups to try and steer their colleagues through this minefield. Um, I'm sure that people are doing their very best um, when they have an ethicist available to them that they can call upon. I dare say every trust has mopped them up uh, and there probably are not enough people fully experienced in that domain to go around. Um, but it isn't fully resolved, but it clearly is a problem and it's a one that everyone realizes is going to be increasingly a problem uh, in the next uh, few weeks. And it's not acceptable to put the burden uh, of that type of decision making on one group of doctors within the hospital, for instance, just the intensive care staff. That would not be an appropriate way to do it. Um, it, I think that people would very quickly 
they become worn out if the onus fell upon the people delivering the care to have to make those decisions day in, day out, unsupported by their institution. Thank you. And someone's just come back on that. Will the GMC support doctors with regards to the clinical decisions they're making when it's not a normal situation and decisions are getting challenging? Uh, yes, I mean, that seems to be the um, uh, prevailing philosophy of the GMC. There's a widespread acceptance that we are in a unique period. Uh, we have no clear precedent for this, and uh, I think that the GMC, in all of their documentation so far, uh, have expressed a supportive attitude for the profession um uh, to date and i suspect that that will remain to be the case okay um i'm conscious of time um so should we just mm. do two more questions yeah uh, 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 can surgeons who have tested positive for oh gosh can surgeons who have tested positive for covid19 and recovered consider themselves immune and be less of a burden on ppe resources um, again, slightly tricky question. Um, we don't know for 100% that uh, uh, being tested, uh, having an antibody test that says that you uh, have been infected in the past uh, necessarily equates the fact that you are definitely immune in the future. Um, although, of course, if we take the analogy with most other viral illnesses, uh, if you've had a proper viral illness, then that is generally the case. Um, it's, it's a tricky question. Of course, the implication is that if we could have an antibody test uh, available, and, and it is very close, of course, as many of you know, uh, and we could test a large number of the uh, medical workforce, particularly for us, the surgical workforce, and if we knew that they were uh, immune, as it were, uh, then obviously that raises the idea that you could get more people back to work sooner um, uh, and that you could, of course, um, reduce some of the need for protection. Now. A, a, a little bit of a lag here in being absolutely sure about what that means. In theory, that's how it kind of works, but I think it, there's just a little bit of caution required before you kind of just fully accept that as a way back in the practice. Obviously, in countries that are ahead of us in terms of the pandemic, we may have lessons to learn about what those risks are uh, for uh, people who are immune uh, going back to work, at least perceived to be immune, going back to work and under what circumstances they can function. Um, so uh, there's there's lots and lots of questions that have just come in all of a sudden, but I'm just going to do the final one um, because it's come, okay. up, come right at the yeah. end. Um, what are the possible plans for the MRCS exam and what are the impacts they're going to have on people's training progression? Uh, there are no plans for us to conduct any examinations uh, by this college or by any of the other colleges because the, our examination system is in the collegiate for the foreseeable future. We have no revised dates at the moment and we have not concentrated on the provision of new dates for examinations at this time. Uh, we do not have the resources to devote uh, people to uh, working out examinations and exam schedules. And of course, we have no idea about our resource in terms of examiners for future exams until we are some months away yet, uh, and when we can see an end to this crisis, then we'll address that issue. At the moment, uh, it, I'm afraid that uh, there are no plans for any further examinations at this stage. I mean, we are obviously concerned that's a major issue for some of you out there, and it is something that we are talking to HEE about um, our exams team are also giving some thought to what uh, 
possibility yeah. there might be under this under these uh, very very unusual circumstances so uh, it's um it's 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 very uh, unsettling for you and we're very disappointed not to be able to uh, offer those um, exams for you but we are talking very much with HEE to see what we can do and where necessary with the GMC to see what we can do yeah. to overcome some of these hurdles. It's very difficult for us to um, put in place any type of assessment, not an exam, uh, that uh, you uh, as trainees would all believe to be a fair uh, assessment. But please uh, understand HEE in particular are really concerned about this and um, you know there, there will be an announcement uh, about some type of solution but not in the foreseeable future an exam as you would know it right lucy is that it i mean there's lots but i'm just conscious that we said that we we're going to go till seven and we're we're five past now um, so we, uh, um, I mean, I think the important thing, two important things for me to say, I think what, one of them is that um, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of questions coming in, which is great, thank you, this is what I was trying to say when I was so cruelly cut off in my prime earlier, uh, and you might be able to see in the text there that we will endeavour to get question, to, to get answers to your questions after the webinar by whatever means. So we don't just want to leave them hanging in the air. We'll try and get answers to you uh, as much as we can. Uh, and the second thing, I think yeah, I'm, I'm allowed to say this, Derek and Lucy, is that we will try, we will try and set up some more of these webinars yeah. um, with Derek, the president, with, with um, some other of our uh, council surgeons and officers and so on. Uh, who uh, might have particular expertise in particular areas. Um, we'll, we'll set more of these up, so please uh, do keep the questions coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll do more. Uh, you won't have to look at uh, my ugly mug alone in future. Uh, for those of you who wonder if I was wearing my black and white football shirt underneath my jumper here, it's not actually, it's just a black T-shirt. Um, but, but I know that Mr. Reed was concerned that at the end of this webinar, I might sort of whip my jumper off in the style of a Newcastle United supporter and, um, as it were, show you the black and white strip. Uh, I hope that you've found tonight useful. I hope that the explanations were half decent and um, we look forward to uh, having further webinars and. Uh, Let's hope that uh, we can all sustain our efforts uh, over the coming weeks in what I suspect will be increasingly difficult circumstances for all of us uh, in all parts of the world, not just in the United Kingdom. Um, look after yourselves. Remember, your personal protection is really paramount here. Otherwise, you cannot help all of the patients who desperately need surgical support. Thanks. <laughs>